Tell us what you most remember about Zanuck. Well, you know, when you talk about the polo mallet, you yeah. know, he would walk up the main street of, of uh, 20th to the, to the cafe and he'd swing the mallet <laughs> like that, you know. It was just like a, a, a nervous thing, or what do you think that was? Well, you know, he was a, a tremendous talent. I mean, he was a wonderful writer. Yeah. He knew he had a concept about editing and a concept about the kind of pictures he wanted to make. He was a powerhouse, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's when it was a family business. Mm -hmm. You know, it was to, to be in the movies and to be, you know, a possibility of being coming a movie star. It was so exciting, yeah. you know, as it was an exciting time. He did it, you know what I mean? He, he had his own concept and it was family. You know, when I went to the studio, I had the feeling that the people really wanted me to be successful. Mm -hmm. And they, they cared about me. And I cared about them. Hi, I'm Scott Feinberg from The Hollywood Reporter. We are here at the SAG Foundation with Robert Wagner. It's great to have you here for a career retrospective conversation. Thanks for doing it. Um, yes. And I guess to begin with, let's begin right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. Well, it makes sense, right? <laughs> um, where were you born and raised? I believe you've been, you, you came here pretty early in life uh, to L.A., but where, yeah, where were you I, born? I was born in, um, in Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. But my family moved here in 1936. And so uh, I went to school out here, military school, and my family moved out here. And uh, we've been here, I've been here ever since. What did your folks do that led them to, I think, was it Bel Air is basically where you grew up, right? Yes, uh, my, my dad retired uh, and moved out of uh, Michigan because he, my mother uh, had uh, asthma and that kind of thing and difficult time breathing. And so they, they went to Florida and they went to Arizona and then they went to California and they decided to settle here. Nice. Which well, I was very happy about. I was going to say, there were worse, worse places. Um, I believe at a pretty early age, maybe in school, is that where acting first entered the picture? Well, you know what? The school I went to, Irving Thalberg's son went there. Seriously? So uh, I was a boarder, and on the weekends, uh, we went to different, pl different families' homes to spend the weekend. And I went, uh, Irving asked me to come to his house, and... And I met uh, his mother. Norma Shearer, yeah. Uh, yeah. And your Norma Shearer. Yeah. And she was doing Marie Antoinette at the time. Wow. And they, uh, they ran Marie Antoinette at the school. And I said, that's not her home. You know, that, that, when I was there, I, I, you know, I didn't know anything about the right. movies. I didn't right. know anything about it. She was wonderful to me. Very nice, very lovely person. And... Uh, when I wrote my book, uh, I have a picture of her that she gave to me. Oh, that's great. And I put that picture in the book. She was very, very nice, and I was so excited about maybe a movie star, you know. And she was one of the biggest. Sure. And it sounds like, though, just being in town, um, I think caddying and things like that, you met a lot of movie stars at an early Clark Gable and Cary Grant, Fred Astaire. When I, when I went to that school, by the way, <coughs> Fred Astaire's son went there, and they asked me to come to their home on the weekend. And I remember Fred Astaire picking me up and putting me in his car. I didn't know who Fred Astaire <laughs> right, was, right, of course. Right. You know, I was like seven years old or something. Right. But isn't that remarkable? I, I wound up, you know, he played my father in uh, It Takes a Thief, and wow. uh, oh, my God, it was amazing, you know. So you eventually... Um, there's a thing where you end up being taken to Warner Brothers also, right? Like somebody, how do you end up at the casting oh, office? My, at my friend, Jay Stanley Anderson, yeah. knew, knew uh, uh, the casting director, Sally Bayano, at Warner Brothers. And uh, he knew that I wanted to be an actor. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can set you up to go to see Sally Bayano. So I went out there. He was a wonderful man, by the way. Terrific guy. And uh, he said, uh, what do you do? You know, he said to me, what, what do you do? I said, well, I, I do Jimmy Cagney, and I do Jimmy Stewart, and uh, I do Clark Gable. He said, we've already got those. <laughs> we've, we've got those already. Right. So, you know, right. he said, what do you do? And I said, 
I don't know, Saul. So, and I, and I, I left. Yeah, I left because I didn't. You know, I didn't know anything about what they what, what they were going to ask me. But and that so that one didn't yield anything specifically. Well, I was set to be in a, one of one of the Warner Brothers movies. Do you remember which? Uh, yeah, it was with Jimmy Cagney. I think it was called The Gray Line. Is that right? I, I think right, so. Yeah. And uh, the, they went on strike. <laughs> It all comes full circle. Yeah. <laughs> they went on strike at that time, and so I went back to school and finished high school. And but I really wanted to be in the movies. I wanted to be part of the movie business. I loved it. So, can you tell us who Henry Wilson was and how you came to know well, him? I, I met Henry Wilson. You know, Henry Wilson was uh, he discovered rock. Hudson and Tab. I was never under contract to him. I, I was uh, at an agency called Famous Artists, yeah. Charlie Feldman's uh, agency, and Henry worked for them. Uh, and I, I met Henry. He was a very interesting man, very, very interesting guy. But he was not your agent at Famous Artists. Was no. tr you were working with Charlie Feldman directly? Well, yes, a bit, and, uh, and some other agents that were there, they were wonderful. And they represented Fox, and they, you know, in those days, <clears throat> the idea was to get under contract to a studio. And so um, they had young players at, at Columbia and Paramount and MGM, and you, I made the rounds to try to get into that young group, because that was the idea, that was the, the way to do it. And I went to all of them, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Clark Gable lined me up to go to MGM. This was just because you'd met him at the country club. Well, yeah, and he, he was also great to me, you know, yeah. he, was, he was wonderful. And he lined me up to go to MGM, and uh, I, I went over there, but it didn't work out. I went to Columbia, I went to Warner Brothers. Columbia, they had the fishbowl. Did you ever hear of that? I did, the one, the two-sided yeah. mirror, right? Yeah, yeah, and they had the producers come in at, uh, you know, at, on the weekends or on, the, on Saturdays or Sundays, and, and they'd look at your performance and see if they could use you and all that. I did that, that didn't work out. But I wound up at Fox, and uh, I met this wonderful woman, Helena Sorrell, who was uh, one of the dramatic coaches there. And um, she thought I had something. So we worked on this scene and she uh, got me to be tested there, screen tested. So I did my screen test at Fox and uh, Zanuck would run them in the evening. And she was there and Zanuck ran, excuse me, ran my test and he said, oh, I don't know. And she said, would, would you run it just once again? I want to show you something. So they ran it again. And she pointed out something. She said, L look at that. Watch that. She said, I think he's got something. And uh, so Daryl said, OK. And they signed me for $75 a week, 55 take home. <laughs> And I was in the movies, there you, you know, and, that, <laughs> and I loved it. That's just for the record, 1948, right? You're 18 right. years old, and suddenly you're in the system. I'm, I'm in the movies. I'm, I'm under contract to Fox. So just for people who may need a reminder, who else was under contract to Fox at that time? Oh, gosh. I mean, you mean that, the young people? No, anybody. I mean, who are you seeing when you go to the studio uh, each well, day. I mean, you know, Gene Tierney was there, Alice Faye, uh, Tyrone Power was the leading man of Fox, yeah. Clifton Webb. I did a couple of pictures with Clifton. He was fantastic. And, uh, oh, there were so many people that Victor Mature. And now, is that for a young guy who grew up, you know, wanting to be in movies, was that kind of jolting? Were you intimidated? Was it? A, how did you feel where you go to what we now call Century City, basically? The lot was bigger then. It and, was 44 acres. Right. right. So you show up and what? You go to lunch in the commissary and you see all these guys, you're walking around. Like, that's not an everyday experience for most people. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Right. And I was thrilled. Yeah. I was really very excited. And they, you know, they, they were all so wonderful to me. You know, the people were so great. It was a family business, and uh, 
they really, you know, I felt they really cared about me, and they did. Yeah. And uh, it was it was great, Scott. Uh, well, you, you can imagine. I, I can only imagine. And uh, I, but I mean, I guess you know now there are books, the the genius of the system, or you know just people that look back at that era and try to make sense of it. But you were there, so can you break it down for us? Just the way there's a book called The Star Machine, where they talk about how they develop people like. You and I think some of your contemporaries would have been like Tony Curtis and Rock Jeff, Hudson and Jeff Hunter. Jeff Hunter. Jeff and I were very close. Right. So what you're you're an investment for them at that point. They've signed you to what, like seven year deal yes, or something. Uh -huh. So what do they do to cultivate your talent when you're there? You're taking different kinds of lessons and things, right? Right. I'm, I was in all of the all the classes. I loved that. What were some of the classes? Well, you know, they we did scenes from pictures that they had made. I did that with other actresses. Uh, I did Marilyn Monroe's test. She tested opposite you. Yeah. Tell, tell well, us I, about that. Yes, I, I was the test boy. Yeah. <laughs> because I wanted to know how it worked. Right. You know, I, I didn't know how it works. Huh? So I, I got the chance to be on a, on a stage in front of a camera with a crew and a director, you know, and... I just took advantage of that, and I, I thought, I did a lot of tests. I was the test boy. Well, that's smart, though, because you get to do scenes. You're probably not getting, at that point, at the beginning, very many meaty parts in movies. Oh, no. Uh, but this is developing. So, so, again, you get there in 1948, and let's just stick with the Marilyn Monroe example for a second, because I think her kind of breakout opportunity at Fox was All About Eve, which is 1950. Yeah, so so you're there before she is. And what do they, they say, hey, we've got a new girl, can you, can you do a scene with her? Yeah, the, the, whatever, whatever was available, I was there. Right. So Marilyn was a wonderful lady, you know. She had a wonderful sense of humor and she was a lot of fun. And uh, we were all young, you know, yeah. we, we were young. Uh, there's a picture of me uh, with her and she's sitting in my lap and I'm looking at her on the test stage. And I looked at the date and it was 1951. I was 21 years old, wow. you know. And I've got Marilyn Monroe. Not bad. <laughs> so now, did, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> now there, there were a lot of beautiful people under contract. Did she immediately strike you as particularly uh, a standout? Well, she was, you know, she was, yeah, she was very different from everybody else. <laughs> my, uh, my wife, uh, uh, I was married to Marion Marshall, mm -hmm. and uh, she's the mother of our daughter Katie, mm -hmm. and. Um, they were the two M's, Marion Marshall and Marilyn Monroe. Right. And Marion would say to me, whenever she, whenever they w went on a, uh, an interview for a, a cover of a magazine, when Marilyn walked in, it was over. <laughs> they knew that she'd get it, you know. Get, right. She had a, she was a tr wonderful, wonderful lady. So another thing that I think, you know, may be a foreign concept to people today is that because you're under contract to a studio, you're not only an investment, but you're, they sort of sometimes regarded people as, as property, right? So you right. both, you're, you're never really off working for them. You work for them during the day, and then even at night, there would be things where social uh, pairings, now you were married, I guess, for uh, a portion of this time, but they would put people out on dates together for public relations. Oh, yes. Talk, like, just, loved it. You did, yeah. Right. <laughs> not, not worse things than that, right? I loved it. But what about dealing with the columnists of that time, where you know today there's tabloids, paparazzi, blogs, all of that. In those days, the people who really, I guess, carried the most weight would have been Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons. Luella Parsons yeah. What did you? What were your dealings with them like? Well, I I was quite close to Luella. Uh, I went to the racetrack with her often. Okay. And. Uh, uh, she was very nice to me, you know. I liked her. She was she was very nice to me. I I knew Hedda Hopper. She was very nice to Natalie and myself. Yeah. And uh, you know the pre the the press department at Fox, you know, would deal with all of that. They had relationships with them, and so they'd say, "Listen, we want you to do an interview with Robert Wagner. He's starting off in the movies, and can you do this and that?" It was a different kind of press then yeah. than it is now. They're not looking necessarily for you know, dirt on people or whatever because they're going to have to deal with the studio with everybody else. Right. Um, and just to come back to the arranged dates for a moment, can you correct? 
confirm or deny the record, did you go, would they pair you or uh, Deborah Paget? Yes. Well, Debbie and I did several movies together. Yes. So that was a... a, a natural, yeah. Yeah, that was natural. Laurie Nelson? No, I, no. I, I, I don't think... I, don't, I knew Laurie. Yeah. I think we might have done a layout together. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Elizabeth Taylor? Ah, yes. Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> well, I knew Elizabeth. Uh, I met Elizabeth when I was like 13 years old. Even before any of the movies? Oh, yeah. How, how did that happen? Uh, Roddy McDowell was a friend and... and yeah. uh, I loved Elizabeth. She was terrific. You know, I produced a movie with her, as you know, yeah. and uh, I, I liked her very much. I, I thought she was just a marvelous person, and she was so kind and, and uh, generous to me. You know, I, I loved her. You wrote... You have Rita Marino down there? No, please. Yeah. Let's keep, keep going. This is... What a hardship. You had to go out with all these... Uh, Rita, yeah. I didn't know. It was really difficult. Yeah, I was going to say. You can imagine. <laughs> it was a very difficult thing. Jane Mansfield. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, one of the things that people may not realize, so you sign at the studio in 48. In 1953, you had one scene in a movie with oh, an actress who Susan was- Susan Hayward. Well, even, no, I'm, I'm, may, I'm sure that's oh. true too, but I'm referring to something else, which is you're playing the boyfriend of the daughter of a character played by Barbara Stanwyck. In Titanic. Oh, in Titanic. In 1953. Yeah. For Jean Nagalesco. Yes. So in your memoir, you wrote um, that, I guess, when this is being made, you're 22 years old, she's 45, and you said in your memoir, Barbara was the first woman I ever loved, close quote. What was the, so this is a big movie with a big movie star, um, and you guys just kind of had a, a very positive experience on that movie. We had a very positive experience, particularly me. Yeah. <laughs> particularly me, because uh, she was so wonderful to me and uh, so, so kind. And I, I really fell, I fell in love yeah, with her. Yeah, sure. It was the first time I was ever in love. Yeah. yeah. And a uh, very exciting time. And she was a spectacular woman. Now, there are some movies that you were a part of before that, which I'm going to bring up and ask you for some thoughts about, but what in your memory was the first really substantive part that you were able to play while under contract to Fox? Well, the picture that did so much for me, yeah. Scott, was uh, with a song in my heart with Susan Hayward. 1952, yes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was cast in that part. Walter Lang directed it, and uh, he was so wonderful with me, as was Susan. And uh, I had to react to her singing, I'll Walk Alone. And uh, she had been through so much, the character, you know, she'd been operated on so much. And um, I, I said to, to Daryl Zanuck, I said, I, I, it's a pretty small spark, pretty small characters, pretty small Two part. scenes, right? Yeah, two, yeah, two sequences. And um, he said, what'll happen? RJ said, I think when the people who walk out of the theater and they'll say, who was that guy? Mm -hmm. Who was that guy that played that part? And that's what happened, and I had tremendous reaction from the fans, you know, and the fans really put me in, in a position to be elevated to bigger parts and right. all of that, and recognized, and uh, that picture did so much for me, and Daryl was so, so nice to me. He cast me in a lot of things. I mean, he was responsible for my success without question. Well, so we'll say in 1952, there's that part as this war veteran dealing with shell shock that you played in with a song in my heart. Same year for John Ford, What Price Glory? You die in the arms of James Cagney. Jimmy Cagney, can you imagine? Not bad. Who you were imitating before you were ever in the movies. Um, I jogged his horses too, you know. Did really? you ever know that? No. You know, he raised trotters. And he had them up on Coldwater Canyon. And uh, I would jog his horses, and I, I knew Jimmy Cagney, uh, you know, personally uh, through, through horses, but he was so terrific. He was such a wonderful man. He was, uh, to be able to, to know him and, and to have worked with him, and I was, I was just, you can imagine, it was just, I was, it was a dream come true. Well, so that's, that's two movies in 1952 with a song in my heart, What Price Glory, and then a third 
Stars and Stripes Forever with Clifton with Webb. Clifton, yeah. And I believe technically that's the one, although I'm sure the accumulation of the three helped where you get a Golden Globe nomination for Most Promising Male Newcomer. That must have felt like a big deal at the time, right? It, it still, was. Yeah. It felt like a yeah, big deal, yeah. and it was, it was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember who else was nominated that year? No, I don't. I, no, I don't remember who, who was my competition. Well, we can, we can look it up. But, uh, I mean, the main thing is that that's the kind of thing where clearly – you're getting momentum. The studio it was is working. You. Yeah, it's it working. The working. machine's working. Yeah. Um, so Clifton Webb was also with you the next year, and you were with him in Titanic, at which yes. we mentioned. Um, but before we go any further than that, you mentioned Daryl F. Zanuck, who's who's running the studio, uh, had previously been the head of production at Warner Brothers, leaves, starts oh. Fox, right? And fantastic career. I want to ask you about him though, because not too many people today can talk about direct dealings with Daryl F. Zanuck. And so, you know, what we hear about, there's sort of the caricature. He's walking around with a polo mallet. Not, yeah. um, he's, uh, you know, kind of foul mouth, but very, you know, he's there all, oh. all day and all night. What was your, tell us what you most remember about Zanuck. Well, you know, when you talk about the polo mallet, you yeah. know, he would walk up the main street of, of uh, 20th to the to the cafe and he'd swing the mallet like that, you know. It was just and like a, a, a nervous thing or what do you think that was? Well, you know, he was a, a tremendous talent. Yeah. I mean, he was a wonderful writer. Yeah. He knew, he had a concept about editing and a concept about the kind of pictures he wanted to make. And um, he was, had a great sense of humor. He was a powerhouse, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's when it was a family business. Mm -hmm. You know, it was... To, to be in the movies and to be, you know, a possibility of being coming a movie star, it was so exciting. Yeah. You know, as it was an exciting time, and and he was, he did it. You know what I mean? He he had his own concept, and it was family. You know, when I went to the studio, I had the feeling that the people really wanted me to be successful, mm -hmm. and they they cared about me, and I cared about them. Sure. You know. Well, and one of the things that was possible then, but, but is not today because the, the Supreme Court broke up the studio system, was that I guess a guy like Daryl F. Zanuck could literally have under glass, apparently, on his desk, the list of all the people who are under contract to him who are actors, directors, whatever, and he can say, all right, for Laura, we're going to take Gene Tierney, uh, you know, Dana Andrews, and Clifton Webb, let's get this director, like you just match things up. Um, that obviously no longer became possible when everybody's a free agent. But can you do you remember being what was Daryl F. Zanuck's office like? What do you visually? If you do you remember his, being his what his office? Because apparently these guys sometimes were on elevated desks and just a crazy situation. They were they were truly moguls. What was do you remember going into his office? Oh, I do remember going into his office, and it was uh, you know he loved polo and he. Uh, he had Zanuck green, and uh, what's that? It was a green. It was a green color. Oh, the color was yeah. The, yeah. And uh, he he was just uh, he was he was great. Yeah. You know, I mean, his office wasn't. I I, I don't as a, you asked me that I I don't remember it being too, too exceptionally crazy, yeah. different. You I know? think it was Mayor who they had put him up on a oh Mayor pedestal, the Mayor was right? on a pe yeah. pedestal above a. <laughs> You know, above people coming right, in. Right. You know, it was like but model that wasn't true. That, that wasn't true with Daryl. Okay. Uh, so, as you're now getting more and more on the map, let's go to 1954, Broken Lance. <laughs> um, <coughs> Pardon me. No, sure. Uh, apparently, your cast at the request of, of Spencer Spence. Tracy right. to play his son. Um, you think I was thrilled with that? Well, you, you tell me. I mean, this is a broken... Can you imagine? So he was... What was he like to work with? Oh, tremendous. Yeah. People say it looked... He's one of these guys, like, I guess Gary Cooper, they say also, like, it doesn't... When you're on... When you're working with him, that some people have said it doesn't seem like he's doing oh, much. It doesn't seem like he's acting. Is that no, right? Okay, no. so... I, uh, I had an interesting experience with Spencer... Uh, in one of the scenes, uh, I think the first scene I was in, I had to write up, and there was some dialogue, 
and uh, I had to say something like, I, I, I think they'll be in Cheyenne or something like, I don't know. But whatever I did, he said, oh, wait, hold it. I didn't hear that. So we went back and did it again. And I said some smart remark like, how do you like that? I'm underplaying Spencer Tracy, some smart ass remark, yeah. you know. So at lunchtime, he had a little dressing in there. He said, he said, Mr. Tracy wants to see you. So I go in there, I say, yes, yes, sir. Mr. Tracy said, what are you thinking about underplaying me for? What, what are you thinking about things like that? You should be thinking about playing the scene. You should be there. And I, you know, he just let me have it. Yeah. Really let me have it. I thought I was going to be taken off the film. Really? You know. But um, I became so friendly with him and his family, and I loved him dearly. I was a pallbearer at his funeral, and his daughter just passed away, Susie, who was a wonderful, wonderful lady. She ran the John Tracy Clinic. As you know, John Tracy was born deaf, and Louise, his wife, was responsible for stopping the expression deaf and dumb. Mm -hmm. You know that. I did not know she yeah. was the yeah. one. And she was a wonderful woman. They were very, very, they were great people. Spence was, Spence was so great to me in my life. I'm so honored to have had the relationship with him. That same year that you made that movie with him, you made a movie for Henry Hathaway, Prince Valiant. Prince Valiant, yes. Playing the title character for the first time, I think, in a movie. Yes, and with my singing sword and yes. my wig. Yes. <laughs> oh, did, I, did, I, took, did. I took so much heat from that. <laughs> the New York actors, oh, they killed me. They thought oh. you, were not, you were not made for period pieces, you thought? <laughs> Maybe that was... They killed me, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, a couple years after that, one of the few times I think you played a, a villain was A Kiss Before Dying. Kiss Before Dying, yes. A really like a cold-blooded killer in that movie, yeah, right? I, I love that part. That tell was, me, tell that, me that why. That was a good part. Is it fun well, to play a bad actually, guy? Actually, my sister read a, uh, an excerpt of it in Red Book, and uh, she said, I think this would be an interesting part for you. And I read it, and uh, my friend Gerd Oswald directed it, Joanne Woodward uh, was her, I think, either first or second film. And uh, we had a really wonderful time. Jeff was in it with me, Jeff Hunter. And uh, I enjoyed that part. Yeah. I liked that a lot. And uh, it turned out to be pretty successful. Yeah. Uh, now, I think, uh, so that's 56 when that comes out. And I think right around that time, you, for the first time, meet another person who's going to be an important figure in your life. What were the circumstances under which you first met and began dating Natalie? Natalie. Natalie. Well, I, I saw Natalie around Fox, you know, when she was a little girl. Right. And uh, we started going out together in 56, I think that's right. And uh, just, she was just so wonderful and fabulous, and I just, I loved her so, and we, and we, we, we hit it off, you know? I mean, it was good. And uh, we got married. In 57? In 50, or no, uh, sorry, was it 57? Yeah, it was 57, I believe, yeah. yeah. Now, when, to this day, when two very attractive, popular, young movie stars end up dating or getting married, that causes a, a big commotion amongst uh, you know, the media and paparazzi and tabloids and all of that. What was it like, I mean, for people who talked about Brangelina or other things that have happened, right? You were, you were that. What was that, did you, how did you acclimate to being? It was, it was pretty exciting, you know. We, we, when we were on our honeymoon, I remember we came back, I got a Corvette and, uh, in Chicago. And uh, Natalie and I drove across the country. And as we drove across the country, we could hear on the radio Natalie Wood, Robert Wagner on Highway 66, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, the kids were starting to follow us, you know. It was, uh, the, the younger people were very much involved with us, you know, they, uh, they thought that we were, we were the couple. Right. And you know what? We were. 
great. Yeah, she was great. Yeah. She was wonderful, wonderful woman. So as you're at this point, both of your careers are really taking off, and we'll say that for you, I, let's 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 look at the fact that you're they're taking off as the studio system that you came out of, both of you, was kind of crumbling. Yeah. What what for you was the evidence that things were changing, that it was not going to be the way it had been at the studios? Well, I think one of the things uh, was that, you, you know, the bigger stars, Gregory Peck, Tyrone, Gable, uh, you know, they, Niven, mm -hmm. they, they were all moving on. They were going independent. And that kind of broke the studio up, plus the distribution. And uh, uh, you could see it was going up, down, but that, 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 that range was gone. And in terms of how it affected you personally, I believe you went for a little while off to Europe, right? So was that oh, your, I did, yeah. your contract, I think, at Fox well, uh, ended it in 1960? Yeah, I think around then. And, that, so, and, and at that point, you're now a free agent. And so there were good opportunities in Europe at that point? Uh, well, there was a series of circumstances happened. Nat Natalie and I split. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was very, you know, it was not good for me. You know, I was very, feeling very sad and, you know, emotionally not. So I went to Europe. And... Uh, when I was in Europe, I got some films. Longest Day. Yes. The Pink Panther. I met Blake in Paris through my, my wife, Marion. Yep. We weren't married at that time, but Marion had worked for Blake and Peter Gunn and, and uh, done a couple of shows with him, and she knew him, and I met Blake in Paris, and we t I liked him very much, and we, we connected. and. Uh, he, the picture was made in Rome, and I was living in Rome at that time. Mm -hmm. And he cast me in the film. Yeah. So I did that picture. I did The War Lover with Steve McQueen, mm -hmm. which I enjoyed very much. I did The Longest Day. I did The Panther. I had, you know, a career was going on for me. Yeah. I did The Condemned of Altona mm -hmm. with uh, Sophia Loren, yeah. who I just, she's just a marvelous yeah. person. Just a marvelous person. And Vittorio De Sica, who... I was so excited to be working sure. with a, one, you know, a, a director like Victoria. My yeah. God, yeah. and I did the the biggest bundle of them all with, uh, you know, with Raquel. Mm -hmm. So I, I had quite a career going on there. And you uh, like being you like working there? Was it very different from the way you'd worked in Hollywood? No, but I liked working there. I liked yeah. the hours were wonderful yeah. and the, the very very good uh, filmmakers there. You know, yeah. in each country they had. Tremendous, tremendous filmmakers. And things like The Longest Day, which is 1962, that was, they were making more um, American movies essentially abroad or Hollywood movies abroad for financial tax related yeah. reasons, right? So there were more, th these are, these are uh, American or British filmmakers working in Europe on the movies that you're mentioning, aside from Desica and some of the others. Yes, but. and they had good financing. Yeah. The financing was very uh, available. And, uh, you know, the, it, sh it shifted. Yeah. It shifted from Hollywood to Europe. Yeah. And I was there before that, right. so it was a nice thing to be able to <laughs> Absolutely. connect, you know. Now, when you came back to the U.S., I think you signed a three film deal with Columbia, right? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. And so those are now the kinds of deals that were happening at the studios here, not no more seven-year contracts and things uh -huh. like It was just a different world back here at that point? Yes, it was. Yeah. There was the contract system was then at, at, at that time was rather gone. Yeah. You know, that, was a, that, that, whole, that whole concept disappeared. And for an actor who had previously had every possible need met at a studio, acting lessons, publicity to build you up, uh, everything. Now you have to go get your own 
ER representation, right. right? And any, any, everything was now piecemeal, right? Yes. Was that freeing or a, a, a kind of a burden from having worked the other way before? Well, you know, it, it worked. Yeah. You know, it worked for me. So yeah. I was, uh, I, I could have, have to say that I was happy that it did. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go back for a second to the Pink Panther, which was 1963 and spawned a whole bunch of sequels and all that. But I mentioned that one because that, in one sense, did not go very well for you, right? What physically happened to you? Oh, on the Panther? Yeah. Oh, I had, you know, I was one of the, I was one of the first to start working. You know, they, you know the story about the Panther. Did you, did you ever know that uh, Peter Ustinov was uh, involved with the Panther? And uh, he, uh, they wanted him to play. Peter was very, Ustinov was very hot at that time. Blake always wanted to have Peter Sellers. So I was in, what happened was that Ustinov uh, had some uh, reactions to the script that weren't very positive. He, he felt that uh, to be improvised, he wanted more on the page and Blake just listened to him because Blake always wanted Peter Sellers. Yeah, right. So he listened to him and let him write it out. He said, well, thanks very much. Get Picked up the again. telephone, called Peter Sellers <laughs> right. and Peter was down in Rome. So by the time he got down there and, and uh, the, uh, the Kappa scene was cast, Ava Gardner was supposed to be in it, and there was all this kind of thing. So they started with me. So Cappy and I did this sequence in, the, in a bathtub where I'm hiding underneath her in the bathtub and Clouseau comes in and all that. And the man had put, the, the, the property master had put uh, the uh, detergent. Like foaming agent. Very, very yeah. heavy detergent. And I was underneath there and it burned the, my eyes and I, I was blind for uh, three weeks. You know, and I still had the scar on, on my eye I, because I just had uh, cataract surgery and they said, you know, what is that? And I, I told them about this story. And uh, Blake and Peter and David all said, no, we'll wait till they were going to take me out of the film, you know. And Blake said, no, I can shoot around him. And we can, and so they, they all were, were behind me and I finished the film. It was a wonderful experience. That must be terrifying. You don't know that your sight's going to come back. Oh, boy, it was, a, it was a bad, very traumatic time yeah. in my life, as you can imagine. Oh, crazy. Now, a couple other movies just to mention around, around this time. 1966 Harper with Paul Newman. Oh yes. Anything uh, come to mind when I say that name? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Loved it being in Harper. I loved mm -hmm. it, that with him. I did. I done another film with him called Winning, mm -hmm. and uh, I love Paul and Joanne. Of course, I knew Joanne. Already, yeah. You know, from from uh, previously, and uh, they were marvelous people. They were marvelous people, yeah. Bruce. They were. They were. Uh, they were great, Scott. Yeah. They were just great. How about one of the most star-studded of these kind of uh, epic disaster movies that they started making? This is 1974, The Towering Inferno. Oh, The Towering Inferno, yeah. You're one of the, I mean, can you remind folks who else was in that movie with you? Paul. Paul. Steve. Yeah. The Queen. Yeah. It was a wonderful cast. Yeah. And Irwin Allen mm -hmm. produced it. And uh, it was a big hit. Yeah. That picture was a big, big hit for him, and I was happy about that because, you know, the studio needed it, and they, they, had, they had it there. Yeah. Uh, two years after that was Midway, another Midway, big yeah. movie, right? Yeah. Irish. Mary, yeah. Walter. Yeah. Walter. Only just recently passed away. It was like over, over 100. Oh, oh he, was, but, yeah. he was a wonderful man. Yeah. He put that picture together, he got some wonderful people in it. You know, Hank Fonda and Charlton Heston and, oh. So now, in the late 60s, early 70s, I think, um, at a time when, you know, now today people talk about TV, it's like a lot of the best stuff is on TV. Yes. But back then, I think there was a bit of a stigma that if you're going from movies to TV, that's pr things are probably not going in the right direction. And yet, in your case, 
um, it actually worked out very nicely, right? I mean, can you talk about... It did. I think Lou Wasserman yes. was a part of the conversation about yeah. you going into TV, right? You know, Lou Wasserman was uh, my agent at one time, and he was now the head of Universal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he called me in and he said, you know, RJ, he said, I, I, I think I got a property that would be just absolutely right for you. And I said, what is it? And he said, it takes a thief. And uh, it was written by Kirby and, and, you know, it was a wonderful part. Alexander Mundy was a great part and I loved it. You got an Emmy nomination? Yes, I did. But, Your father but I, I, was... But you know what, what I was worried about was going into television. Did you think it was a bad well, I, direction? Well, I thought, I thought, you know, I had to give up my motion picture career. Because you're committing to a number of years. Yeah, I hope th that was the idea. Yeah. Hopefully, that it would be a big right. success, and uh, that that character was just wonderful for me. Roland Kibbe wrote it, and uh, it was just fabulous. And they did everything to make me look great, you yeah. know. They and and the character was was really good. I had some wonderful women with me that made it work, and wonderful character actors, you know. Joseph Cotton and oh, my and your God. father, and my father Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire comes How do back you like that picture. one? <laughs> Not bad. Um, I danced with him, by the way. On that, I'm I'm one of the few people that dance with. I him. was gonna say. Uh, <laughs> now, that goes '68 to '70. 1975 is Switch. Yes. Switch two detectives who specialize in cons to trap criminals. Yes. Um, any. Any particular standout memories of that one? Well, Eddie Albert uh, was my partner in that, and he was a wonderful actor. He had done so much in movies, and he was he was really terrific. And we had a joyous time making that. And uh, you guys had done the longest day years earlier, right? Yes. Uh -huh, yeah. And then there was some. I think sounds like some funny. Uh, Silliness of trying, he would try to try to steal scenes or things like that. Was there something about that? Well, you had to kind of watch out for Eddie. You know, <laughs> he ha he had uh, great ability. Uh, you right. know, he was a marvelous actor. Right. So uh, I enjoyed watching him. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> now, back on TV with Heart to Heart. This is 1979 to 1984. Jonathan Hart, a millionaire who dabbles in detective work with his wife, played by Stephanie Powers. Um, produced by Aaron Spelling. This is big time TV. Uh, yes. Anything about, <laughs> anything about that one that you want well, to share? Well, yes. I, uh, you know, uh, uh, Switch had come, into, had come to an end, and I said, my friend was Tom Mankiewicz. Yeah. And Tom uh, really created Heart to Heart. And uh, we both felt that Stephanie was the girl to play mm -hmm. Jennifer Hart. And, uh, I mean, it was a great time, and we put that together, and uh, it worked. You know, the, I, I, what I wanted to do was try to get the feeling of when I watched The Thin Man. That's yeah. what I, you know, that's, yeah. that's what I wanted to try to do. And Tom was a marvelous writer, and Mark Crowley was involved in it. Uh, we had some wonderful writers, wonderful directors, and great people came in to do it. You know, wonderful, wonderful actors came in to support us. And it was, um, Big time. it worked. Absolutely. Um, now, it was, I believe, in the midst of that run of the show that there was a, a time where you were uh, sort of stepping back a bit from acting for a while because of very difficult personal things going on at that time, right? I mean, was that, uh, was there ever any question about continuing with, like, how, how you would move on uh, at that time from, from a very difficult oh, personal time. Oh, you're talking about Natalie dying? Yeah. Well, you know, so many things happened then at that time. It, Bill Holden, who <coughs> Stephanie was with, yeah. he died. And two weeks later, Natalie died. And uh, it was so difficult. There was a... A lot of people that were around me that held me up, you know, and uh, I mean, I, I didn't, everything left me, Scott. I just, it just left me. I, I, I had my three daughters 
and uh, my two stepsons, and uh, they all came in and, and helped me, you know, helped me uh, get up on my feet. And, and uh, you know, I, I look back at it and thank God I, 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 they closed the company down for a couple of weeks and Stephanie and I went back to work and <clears throat> I think that helped me, helped me get on top of it a bit, you yeah. know. Now, the, the next kind of phase of your life was with somebody and, and remains with somebody who, uh, there are, I think you've worked together on seven things going back to oh. 1967. Let's talk about, so this is not great with math, but that would be uh, <laughs> almost, almost 60 years, right? That you and, and uh, Jill St. John have known each other? Yes. Uh, starting oh, I, with I, I, I met her when she was 16. Oh, even further back, yeah, I didn't even realize. She came on the set when I was doing a picture with Bing Crosby and Debbie Reynolds. Oh. And she came on the set and they took some pictures of us together. She, she was under contract to Fox. I didn't realize and that. I, really. And I knew her and I knew her when she was married to Lance and uh, Natalie and I knew them and she came into my life and she held me up, you know. I, uh, she had my my elbow, and uh, we started going together, and and uh, over the a period of time, I, I just I started to fall in love with her. You know, we started to fall in love with each other. We never had anything to do with each other before. She was involved with people, and I was involved. I was married, and you know, but we found each other, and you know, we've been together now. We've been married 33 years. Can you imagine if anybody had ever said to me, I would be involved with Jill at that time? You never know what's going to happen, do you? No. And especially because you, I mean, you guys had, as you say, I guess I didn't even realize it went back to the Fox days. But then on top of that, Banning in 1967, How I Spent My Summer Vacation in 1967, and then years later, Around the World in 80 Days in 89, The Player in 92, Something to Believe in in 98, The Calling in 2002, and North Pole in 2014. I, I, maybe I'm missing, is that? No, yeah. yeah. Well, she was in the pilot of Heart to Heart. Oh, that too? Yeah, she okay. was in the pilot. Okay. Because uh, Tom knew her very yes. well. And um, when I asked her to go out, uh, and she called up Tom, and she said, you know, R.J. has asked me to go out with it to, to, with him for dinner. What do you think I should do? She said, he said, if you don't, somebody else will. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so she said, yes, and I'm sure glad that she did. Yeah, yeah. Because it's been a wonderful relationship, and we're very happy, and I got lucky. You know, I got, I've had so much luck in my life, so much fortune. I'm a very fortunate man. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention another thing that you guys were, were, I believe, both a part of, which was a very memorable, probably the one of the most memorable episodes of Seinfeld oh, in yes. 1997. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell <laughs> well, the yada, yada episode. Well, you know, I, I like everybody, just, just loved, yeah. you know, <laughs> loved the show. Right. And when, when we were asked to do it, said, so, okay, it would be great. So we did it, and um, it made quite an impression. That was a lucky break. You know, you got to <laughs> luck. Well, also in 97 was the first of several Austin Powers films. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Tell us about number two. This is the one-eyed deputy of Dr. Evil. Can you imagine being in the, in the industry for, I guess I was there now, at that point, about 50 years or 60 years, right. and I wound up being number two, <laughs> you know? Uh, I loved it. You know, Mike was sensational, and uh, I had been on Saturday Night Live, and uh, I met him, and he'd written a couple of sketches, and we did his sketches, yeah. and he liked my... my uh, my ability and he felt that that was an interesting character and they wrote that for me that script hit the door and I said whoa <laughs> that's that's gonna be something right 
I loved the movie, by the way. I thought it was so far out. Can you imagine them sitting in the projection room and looking at that stuff and saying, Jesus, what? <laughs> we've done this? Oh. Well, now, you had also, as we noted, worked with another real chameleon, Peter Sellers. Oh, yes. That did uh, Mike in his, you're, this is Mike at his height doing a zillion different characters. People, I remember watching the movie and not even realizing that half the characters were him. So for you, watching him work, did it bring back any memories of Of, of Sellers? Yeah. No, or I, totally different? No, it didn't really, you know, because Mike was a, you know, a ho totally different, yeah. totally different guy. You know, Peter Sellers had a, ha and so does Mike, they have a great range. I mean, when you think of Peter Sellers, you know, and the things that, he's, oh, that he did, I mean, they were incredible. Yeah. And uh, I think, to compare them both, I mean, Peter was more of an interior, interior guy. Mike is uh, out in front. Yeah, oh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, not that he couldn't do that, because he's a very talented man too, but Peter, you know, did some very interesting work. Interesting, and then in sort of the years that followed, as TV was now increasingly becoming more respected and embraced than it had once upon a time been. You're in, I'm gonna just mention a few, if you would like to share any overall thoughts about Two and a Half Men, which, I mean, I don't know if any, even some of the giant hit shows that you'd been a part of, this this audience had to rival the audience that, that those had. So many people watched Two and a Half Men. Oh yeah, I love doing that. Yeah. Two and a Half Men was, uh, very, very interesting, you know. That was the the man who produced that. Uh, I mean, he such a such a talent, yeah. you know. And uh, the actors were great, and I loved doing it. Yeah. I just loved it. Now, another thing that you've done with TV, which is its own, I think, underappreciated skill, is being a guest actor on a big show. To you done it since the streets of San Francisco, but coming in to something like NCIS, which I think you began doing in 2010 and for a number of years, what's it like to pop into a group that's already kind of a, a unit and have to both, you know, sort of seamlessly fit in? Is that fun, challenging? What's that? Uh, you know, uh, Michael Weatherly is absolutely great. He and I became very good friends. Mark Harmon ran a company that was so beautiful, and the cast was so great, and they were all wonderful to me. David McCallum, we've worked together a lot. We did a series together called Cold Dits in England, and uh, it was the one of the most. It, it was it's the best company I worked with. They were all great. Wow, all of them. Now. About a week ago, I think it was, you and I spoke about somebody named Scott Amon, who is the author of a lot of books about Hollywood, including three in tandem with you. I know the answer to this, but can you share, how did you guys begin working together? Because that is quite a, a legacy in and of itself, the documentation of Hollywood that you guys have done at a time when, again, there aren't many people who can speak with first-hand knowledge about those days in Hollywood like you can, and Scott is great at putting it into beautiful words. So talk you, about that. You know what, you know what happened? I, I read a book that he did on, on uh, L.B. Mayer mm -hmm. called... Uh, the Lion of Hollywood. The Lion of Hollywood, yeah. yeah. The Lion of Hollywood. It was a wonderful book. He made L.B. Mayer a human being. And... Um, and L.B. Mayer was the greatest producer we've ever had in the motion picture industry as of now. And, uh, you know, I, I knew a, a, a friend of mine, Ted Bell, I told Ted, I, I want to do a, a book. And, uh, we, and he was also an author and uh, created a character called Hawk, which was very successful. And um, I said, I read this book by Scott Iman. He said, I know him. I said, could you introduce me to him? He said, sure. So I was in Florida, and Scott lives in Florida, and uh, we met in a bar, and uh, we just hit it off. 
And today we're fast friends. We're, we and his wife are great friends of, of ours. And I started talking to him about the book and what I wanted to do, and he, uh, he reacted to it, and I just respected him so much. And we did three books together, as you said. And uh, I... Uh, Should we say, for people who want to go and do extra learning about you after, this, after watching this interview, Pieces of My Heart was the first, I believe, the yes. memoir. You must remember this. Yes. And what's the third? I'm blanking. The, uh, I loved her in the movies. Right. About all the love all the interests. leading ladies. Not, yeah. That, uh, that I had met. How many yes. people could have written that book? That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, has it been, do you enjoy, I mean, we've done a lot of it today looking back, but when, you, when you're thinking about a Hollywood that is no more, but you were, I mean, in a way, you're like a, a preservationist. Like people, oh. so just what's, when you think back and write about those times and, um, you know, both, you're doing it both on a personal level of things that you went through, but also in some of those books, you're talking about the period at large, not necessarily specific to you, but just as a historian, really. Mm -hmm. um, do you enjoy writing? Yeah, it was, uh, it was more difficult than I thought it would be. Yeah. It was difficult to give it up, yeah. you know, to say, okay, that's it. But, um, you know, I have been such a fortunate man. I, uh, I did what I wanted to do. I got into the movies, and I went forward, and I had some success out of it, obviously. And... I'm just such a fortunate person, you know. I've been very, very lucky. And I'm grateful for that. Very grateful. Because it's so meaningful in my, in my soul and in my heart. You know, I'm a, I'm a lucky man. Well, I am not the brightest guy in the world, but I know when to end an interview, and that is a perfect place to do it. So thank oh, you so much. Really appreciate so much. it. Thanks a lot.